right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined from the North Vancouver area up in British Columbia by Kathy Andrews. How are you doing, Kathy? Great. Thanks, John. So nice to be here. Yeah, and Kathy's a distinguished coach, organized development consultant, thought leader, people and culture strategist and human resources leader with over 20 plus experience in the industry, is an authority on building positive, inclusive and high performing workplace cultures. Her journey is both inspiring and educational. She transformed organizations across the globe through her experience in leadership, team dynamics and strategic human resources. And what we're going to talk about today is leadership development in action real practices versus best practices or is it best practices versus real practices i don't know that's why i'm going to ask you why why the real practices versus best practices kathy oh, great great question john we've been moving away from the concept of of best practices quite intentionally over the last few years um, for a few reasons the first is that uh, whilst models and tools and theories have their place they can inspire thought and action and mindset shift um, they only get you so far on the journey and probably not as far as you really think in the journey. Mm -hmm. And really the best leaders that we work with are the ones that can, can very effectively and authentically, and that's the, the underlined word, authentically bring them to life in their businesses and do so with humility and a lot of self-reflection and, and kind of iterate and the other reason we we talk about practice is is it's not real or best. It's about leadership being a practice mm -hmm. and a habit, as opposed right. to a, a a title or a role or a destination. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, because because on that, let's face it. I mean, there's a lot of people uh, end up in leadership positions, uh, career progression by default. Uh, you know, maybe they wanted to be a leader, but uh, but the reality is, very few people are trained in any any training in leadership per, per se, or even even and put even putting training aside for a moment, have even thought about kind of leadership on a, a more than a superficial level. And that's not a criticism of people. That's just mm -hmm. generally how things evolve. You know, you're a team leader, you're, you know, you're a manager. Suddenly you're like you're maybe you're, you know, a significant person in the organization. And you, people are taking a lot of cues from you, but you're kind of oblivious because you've never really been thought about how your role has evolved, shall I say? Yeah, well, a hundred percent. It it tends to be um, a journey of people getting promoted because they get really good at what they do, which is their mm -hmm. domain expertise, their technical skills, their problem solving skills. And as you see through, and, and I'm sure you've experienced this, as you transition through different levels of the organization, um, your world really changes quite drastically and you're no longer the problem solver. In fact, the problem solving habit can get in your way. And so there's a whole bunch of other skills that people I think underestimate and, and take for granted. And then it can really help, it, it starts to trip them up. Mm -hmm when they haven't actually been quite intentional about building their toolkit tool yeah. and, and um, um, you know, increasing their expertise in this, in this area. Yeah, no, no, it's a, it's a, it's a really good point. And I like what you kind of started off about is, you know, best practices can become uh, and anything that's super rigid, you know, can become very restrictive, right? And sometimes, like, and and let's face it, the the, the pace of of change and everything today, having a best practice, it's almost like anachronistic because the moment you have a best practice laid out, you're going to have to change it anyway. So being able to be flexible but intentional at the same time, I think that's probably the sweet spot. I think that it really it is. It's intentional about the fact that this is a thing. These are skills mm -hmm. and 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 areas of focus require my attention, and that it's in the domain of people and relationship. And pe you know, people often talk about, oh, well, I need some sales training, or I need some mm -hmm. communication training, and um, and and that's going to improve my relationships or mm -hmm. improve my. But you know, for for us, you know, c communication is the relationship. And the relationships is what leadership's about. And mm -hmm. so um, as long as you've got 
you've got sort of the these things on your radar you can slowly build build your toolkit up and make it part of of the way you go about your day and, and lead and engage teams mm -hmm. coming back to what you said around on sort of best practices you're quite right the moment you you sort of anchor in on an approach as being the one way the best way it's going to be it's going to be dated and it's not because the theory and the model is wrong it's because people change mm -hmm. people's expectations of the workplace change uh, the ages and the um, types of sort of lived experience ever evolving in terms of the team mm -hmm. that you inherit or the team that you're hiring and so you do have to be flexible you mm -hmm. do have to be um, uh, focused on it otherwise you know mm -hmm. it can very quickly get away from you and you you, you see things like disengagement uh, people that just aren't sticking around um, in fighting politics, the interpersonal mash that can just yeah. tap teams. <laughs> all the good stuff. Yeah. All the stuff that we love yeah. in, in, in corporate, uh, in business. Um, it's kind of funny because you, you, what you're just touching on there, I love that thing with the best practices and things. It just made me th think is like martial arts is my hobby, my yeah. side thing. And I was standing outside our dojang a few weeks ago waiting um, for class to begin. And this guy just randomly stopped me and just out of the blue goes, what did Bruce Lee mean by the best technique is no technique? And I was like, whoa, that's a heavy question for this, uh, for an <laughs> afternoon. But the point is, like, what I was explaining to him is what Bruce Lee meant by that was that you don't get hung up on techniques. You have to adapt and use what you do and have it flow naturally and work yes. for you in the right situation. And I think that's kind of exactly what we're talking about here is not to get hung up on the rigidity of the best practices to figure out how does it work for you, for your team, for your organization now, today. Mm -hmm. I love that you brought in martial arts. My son just got his green belt. Oh, Tom, congrats. And it's just been so wonderful to watch him progress and absorb, uh, the, you know, the tools and that become a part of the way he holds himself. And I mm -hmm. think I think it's very, it, there's some beautiful parallels you can draw to, to leadership practice in that there are things, there's feedback models mm -hmm. and contract resolution models and planning tools and, you know, sales scripts and things you can you can start to to digest and they you know I, I do sort of see them as being things that kind of wash over you get embedded mm -hmm. and pull out when you need but it, the practice is knowing yeah. what to do when um and that sort of situational judgment yeah. versus it being this is the way that i will do feedback for all time or this is the way that i'm going to engage in my strategic planning process yeah. and very fluid yeah yeah, actually, and I like uh, you mentioned that, though, about the communication piece, too, because let's face it, uh, I think we have somebody told me recently we have five generations in the workplace, mm -hmm. like the first time ever. Right. We've got the most generations in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And those a lot of those generations like to communicate differently, like to receive information differently. And it's not all generational. There's some people who are older who like to get information the way the younger people like it and vice versa and all of that. But the point being is that not that one size ever fitted all, but there were probably but there were certain constraints once upon a time. Today, I think if you're going to be an effective leader, you've got to figure out how to communicate the same message in multiple different ways to kind of multiple different audiences. I com I, I, I completely agree. Um, you know, and, and and enroll and engage and shift your style based on on your audience. It's it, it's not, it's not a one size fits all for sure. Yeah, and what what are some of the ways that leaders can start to um, look at how they how they can adapt to, as I said, this this workplace that that is 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 quite demanding. Many the other the other nice wrinkle that we always like to throw into it too is not only do you have all these generations. But you may never even have met or seen ninety percent of them. Maybe they're virtual. They work. Maybe yeah. they're contractors. Uh, you know, because we have these hybrid work uh, forces today, which could there could be some full time employees. There may be a, some of them in an office somewhere. Most of them may be remote. There may be others who are contractors, but have been with the team for a long time. People who do fractional work. All of this. So it's it's quite a distributed workforce. So that raises even more challenges. Yeah, and it's really, it's a lot of cognitive load for mm -hmm. any particular leader to go, oh, you know, I've got, I've got a message, I need to deliver it in seven different ways. In fact, it's 
it's just not possible. So what we we talk about it at Singer is that you don't get you don't get the culture you wish for. You get the culture you deserve. Mm-hmm. And if you're not actively attending to your culture every single day, it's probably not one you like. You know, it's getting in your way and not supporting your strategies. And so people say, well, how do we how do you build culture? And especially how do I build culture with with such a diverse um, team uh, mm-hmm. who have vastly different needs? And so we try to keep it simple in our guidance and our advisory. And we say, you know, you can't you can't measure people up to a report card you haven't set. And so one of the best ways to really get clear on what it is we stand for and articulate the behaviors that are going to really set teams up for success is to do that as a collaborative process. So rules of engagement, if you will, or ground rules. So if you have a team, it's it's leaders that take the time to go, okay, what do we, what do we want to be known for Mm -hmm. and actually articulate those. And what you find is that different generations and different people with different diverse backgrounds and everything have a lot of common ground. Mm -hmm. When you surface the common ground, you've got your rally and cry. And although people are very different and we might have different um, styles, things that we show show up with, we also have a lot in common. Yeah, that's that's a really fascinating point. That's beautifully put uh, because, yeah, because we tend to, as human nature, you know, we tend to look at, you know, the differences and, you know, different, we're in this generation, they're in that generation, this, all of that. One of the things, though, I, I, I really like what you said there about the expectations, because I think that's where we often fall down, is mm-hmm. that you learn about a culture in an organization, you learn about what's, you know, what's expected, what's not expected almost almost by trial and error right i mean that's how most of you know learn like oh i didn't realize that until you get you know slapped around the head by hr for something or you get pulled up on something you go because we don't do a good job of setting expectations and particularly i think uh, communication expectations you might say yeah this is what you know email whatever but how mm-hmm. how communication is 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 given and received and stuff i mean those kind of things that I, I don't think many companies really set expectations around no they don't and you learn it through osmosis because Mm -hmm. you said trial and error some of it's going to be in your policies or it's going to be the subtext of your policies or when you you know get into project meetings and you just start to to notice the patterns of of habits and behaviors and Mm -hmm. i think companies do really well to set the the what the work aside for a moment and just get clear on how Mm -hmm. and not just to pay at lip service because you know you everyone can articulate a set of core values and put it on a poster um how do you bring that to life and i think when you let's say you do have a set of core values but you bring them off the poster and you mm. talk about what is actually what does it mean to us as a team you know even a microculture what does it mean to mm-hmm. our team what does good look like what are the things we we just, we just don't want to do because we know it gets yeah. in our way and you, you you have that as a collaborative process and then the leader holds people to account. The team holds one another to account. Um, but it's clear and it's explicit to everybody as opposed to it being um, something you have to sort of gather by mind reading or guessing or trying and apologizing. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And I think when it comes to when it comes to cultures and core values and stuff, I mean, to my mind, you know, if if you're better off not having them on a poster on the wall. If you're, if they don't really mean anything, if you're, if you can spot like a hundred incidences of them being broken on a regular basis, you're almost better to say, Oh, we don't have any, (laughs) you know, we're just, you'll find out if you cross the line, but we don't really have any. I mean, I'd, I'd actually have, have more respect for an organization that said that to me, then gave me a beautiful presentation on their core values. And 10 minutes later, I see the CEO acting differently. Out of an, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's the worst possible thing you can do to undermine the trust in, in your organization. Um, you know, is it, 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 but you do see a, a lot of organizations do that is, yeah. is they go through the full exercise and they have lots of fancy comms at every level and then it falls down in the day to day and yeah. people just disengage as a result. So what are you seeing then now in terms of, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things that are changing in order to be successful leaders. You know, what are some of the things that maybe you weren't talking about two or three years ago that you're talking more about today or even a year ago? What are, what are some of the things that you're seeing are coming to the fore that perhaps mm-hmm. were always there, but maybe weren't getting the attention they deserved or needed? Mm-hmm. 
So I think in the last few years, because of the impact of the remote workforce and the sort of macro shifts of, of diverse diverse teams that impacted George Floyd, um, what I see as some winning practices are really leaders showing up in authenticity and um, and and in their humanity. And that doesn't necessarily mean they're not confident or apologetic. It's just that people are craving connection. Mm -hmm. And they are really looking for um, that connection with with the, their leader, especially if they're working remotely. So what we see is things like connection before content. So if you'd open a, a meeting up and you've got your your huddle, your your weekly, that leaders are um, are really sort of taking charge of those moments as people connect to the call to connect with the human being mm -hmm. and. And it's not just how was your weekend. I think there's some lots of lazy things we can do, and we we think of connection, <laughs> but it's it's really not. It's it's really taking the time to get to know the human beings that are contributing to um, your working world, so that then you know you're cognizant of everything that's happening, and it, it can happen very quickly, but with a you know slightly richer question set of questions on the top of a call that then you know creates those connections and and builds trust before you get into the into the work. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that as a practice because it's so simple. And we we ask a lot of a lot of our teams and there's a lot of dedication they need they need to bring to the work that they they mm -hmm. offer you. Um, so in return, you know, they, they do expect these days a sense of community. And we can we can create that through these little moments. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, but as you know, I mean, it's, business always gets in the way of these things. So again, going back to what you were saying is they have to be intentional and uh, and uh, and they have to be authentic too, because if that's not really you or you don't really care about that kind of thing, you probably shouldn't do it because it doesn't come off very well anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but I think today, I think most leaders like recognize and people recognize, you know, the fact, because let's face it, everybody went through COVID together was the first, you know, true global, I think, globally shared experience. Because even if you think the, the world wars weren't re really world wars, there were plenty mm -hmm. of the planet that was unaffected by them. But this was a shared experience. So I think that whole concept, I think people are getting it more and more, the idea of needing connection. I just think sometimes people aren't sure just how to do that, because maybe it feels a little, just a little alien to them. Yeah, and 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 if it is forced or trite, it fit, mm -hmm. it quickly falls apart. So I think it's finding a way to live into that um, the concept of look, I, I you know I care about you, and and I'm grateful for the, the fact that you've you've shown up to do to do some work with us, um, and I'm interested in who you are, and that can look like um, you know what did you think of the game on on Saturday night, or that can look like um, you know, you know, a more personal connection, asking about a spouse or a partner, or whatever it is. It's just taking those moments to, which just connection before content, just mm -hmm. connect with the human. Um, because so much rides on you, you, high trust relationships. And if you don't have that trust or that social capital with your team, when things get difficult, it quickly falls apart. Yeah. So we and think, course, about, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and of course, we have that little wrinkle thrown into it now, the all the AI and which is now, you know, where people aren't even sure anymore what's real, where it's coming from. Is it even, I mean, you've heard AI stuff recently where, I mean, it sounds like real people and sounds like real conversations. And anyway, so, I mean, I think as, as, as that develops, I think it's going to also put more pressure on people wanting those human connections, those real connections, those authentic connections, because they're going to want some anchors somewhere. I, I completely. I was, um, I was listening to an episode you did a few weeks back, I think with Amy Franco. And I think you were talking about trust and mm -hmm. the of trust. And you know, the way we hold it is inspired by Stephen Covey's work. And that is trust yeah. isn't, it's not something you have or you don't have. It's, it's like a bank account. Mm-hmm. And so if your bank account is really full, I hear you've got really high trust with your colleague or your teammate or your direct report, it can it can withstand withdrawals, it can withstand some some things that'll tax you, the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and you make those deposits by those little investments 
every yep. time you connect. Hey, yep. I see you. Great, you know, really grateful for your contribution. Whatever, whatever it, um, the the words are to 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 send a signal that you're appreciated, you're seen, you're valued. Mm -hmm. um, I'm watching how you're developing. I'm going to give you some honest feedback and, and course corrections. They they all, if done well, are deposits into those trust accounts on your team. Yeah. And when times get tough, you can lean into that a little bit because they inevitably will. Yeah, absolutely. And what I like from what you just said there is, uh, it, again, it's like, you know, human humans were wired kind of weird in many ways, very, very strangely. And, and one of those is that we're we're fantastic at catching people when they make a mistake or they do something wrong or they yeah. don't do something the way we want. We're great. We're eagle eyed. We're onto that at a moment. We see that from 100 miles away. Mm -hmm. When somebody does something good, we just kind of blow past it. Uh, mm -hmm. And and this this is something that you, you have to almost teach yourself is to catch people doing something right. Mm -hmm. and try and flip that on its head because i always come back to it's like those horrible performance reviews that uh, we all used to have to suffer through or give out i couldn't stand you know the annual performance reviews <laughs> and mostly in mean, most organizations it would be okay kathy here last year oh you did this very well yes well well done on that now here's 55 other things that you didn't do very well that we're going to focus on this year <laughs> you know so oh, yeah. that idea of like just flipping it and starting to focus on catching people doing good things yeah, they've actually studied this, and um, you may have to sort of fact check me here, John. But I, I kind of like throwing the statistic out, even though I haven't fact checked it, because I'm I'm inclined to believe there's there's real truth behind it, and that is the best teams have a have a ratio of 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 positive to negative contributions to one another. Do you want to take a guess of what that ratio might be? Positive to negative feedback on the best performing teams. What's the that ratio? Oh, I don't know, like. Five to one, which way? In, in best performing team, probably five and positive, is it? Yes, that's right. You've you may oh. have heard that before, and and so because we are hyper focused on on things that don't go well, leaders in particular, they, you know, you you forget that, and it, it is so important. And not only do we forget it, but we shortchange it. We get yeah. lazy with our feedback. We say things like "Good job," "Well done," <laughs> and the person's going great. Yeah, I'm about, but I'll do it again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I, no, you're you're so right because whereas if it's uh, if it's a mistake, I can go all the way down oh. into the weeds on it. I could spend hours showing you what you did wrong. <laughs> exactly, but taking the moment, you know, same feedback model we use for constructive feedback, be specific, etc. Do it for the positives too. Yeah, um, and people really appreciate it, and yeah. that goes a long way. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, this has been fantastic. So all of Kathy's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, so we're based in North Vancouver, a boutique consulting firm. And we focus on leadership development bespoke workshops. We don't do anything canned. Everything we do is tailored to your organization virtually or in person. We do adv advising and, and consulting practice. And so if you've got a performance review program that John was talking about and it's not give, getting the outcomes you want, give us a call. And then finally, we do executive coaching one-on-one -on -one for those leaders that are either new to leadership or need to level up to a different um, uh, role, enterprise leadership. We, we support you every step of the way there. So would love to, uh, would love to hear from you. Yeah, no, I'd encourage people to go and go check your performance review processes because I guarantee you they're probably about 20 years old. Maybe if they're, you know, you might be lucky if they're only 20 years old. But I guarantee you, if you if you spend a couple of moments looking at it, you'll realize it's not a very good process. So call Kathy and her team. You need to get that part fixed. <laughs> thank uh, well listen thanks very much kathy thank you for watching and listening and i will see you all again very soon thank you